everyone. This is Credential Up Houston. My name is Margaret Ford Fisher. We are introducing a special series on jobs in Houston. Companies in Houston are hiring and HCC along with our business and industry partners want you to know about the jobs that are available, where you can get the accelerated training and what is needed to qualify. Joining us today to begin the conversation are Mr. Peter Beard, Senior Vice President of Workforce Development at the Greater Houston Partnership, Dr. Michael Webster, Associate Vice Chancellor of Workforce Development at the Houston Community College. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thanks, Margaret. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. So in this segment, I would like for us to discuss some of the factual information that you are gathering, the issues and the challenges. We know that we have Upskill Houston represented as well as the new initiative established by HCC with jobshouston.com and all of the wonderful work that is being done with jobnowhouston.org. So I'd like to ask you, what are you hearing from industry about available jobs with their companies? So Margaret, I think there are a couple things that um, are important to understand here. One, uh, many of our industries and companies were deemed to be essential businesses, so they never really shut down. They may have kind of scaled back their operations. So there are a number of companies that are still doing the work that you know existed before COVID and, and, and currently. And then there's a whole segment of the economy because we had the stay in, you know, stay home, be safe order, you know, that had to shut down except for those essential businesses. And so we're now beginning to see some of those businesses, businesses reopen uh, to provide opportunities, a lot in kind of the retail, um, small businesses that weren't able to stay open. Um, and we're beginning to see pick up there. But you know, going back to the other one, our main industries like, you know, construction and manufacturing and um, petrochemical and healthcare, we're doing some, you know, we're out there doing work. Although, you know, on the healthcare side, there was also, you know, the hospitals were clearly open, but a lot of the non-essential parts of the health systems, you know, slowed down and, you know, probably had people not working. So they're bringing those folks back now that they can, you know, start, you know, elective uh, procedures. Um, and so there's some opportunity, but, you know, the other thing that has happened really is, you know, a lot of companies are rethinking what this business environment is because it's really uncertain in terms of how long so the recovery is going to occur. And so they've, you know, begun kind of right-sizing themselves to kind of weather through this. The one down sector, obviously, is our energy sector, particularly the upstream and midstream uh, parts of the business, uh, but we're still seeing, you know, you know, positive areas in other places, but it's going to be probably a slow slog for now. Obviously, with COVID-19, that has created a lot of problems as well. So I'm wondering, what in the roundtables are you hearing uh, as well? Is it the same information that you're hearing from the industry leaders? It's similar, yes. I mean, in, but I think the other thing that occurred when this happened is it accelerated something that was already beginning to happen, and you could call it, you know, the digital transition that so many businesses are beginning to integrate technology into how they operate their businesses. And so there are jobs that I would say are at risk of what I would say is displacement. That is, people might lose their jobs because they become automated. There'll be others where people need to be much more, you know, agile in working aside, you know, beside technology. And so probably need stronger digital skills. You know, when you look over the you know, change over time, many, many occupations now require at least medium digital skills, if not high digital skills. And so that would be an area, you know, if folks were thinking about where I should be working or at least strengthening my skills, it would be in digital skills from kind of basic word processing and spreadsheets to, you know, customer relationship management software you know, SQL, you know, programming languages, et cetera. And I think those are some of the things we should be thinking about as well. With Dr. Webster, you are serving on a number of workforce boards as well, and you're listening to the industry leaders and you're working in various uh, groups. So are you hearing similar types of messages and what are additional challenges that they are finding now, given COVID-19 in particular? We are seeing quite a bit of a, a need for anything IT 
uh, particularly in cybersecurity. Um, the employers are calling, they need workers, uh, especially in this environment where uh, the exposure can be a little bit higher uh, because they're off of company networks, uh, folks are, they're at home, uh, they're using their own uh, hardware as opposed to secured hardware that, that's uh, back up at the, the office. So anything in the security realm for IT is huge right now. Uh, the other place that we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, need is uh, in logistics. Uh, obviously, the supply chain was hit pretty hard during the pandemic. Uh, they're still kind of uh, coming back uh, full online from that. Uh, if you go into the grocery store, you'll obviously see that there's still uh, some issues uh, with, with product being in, in place. Uh, and then um, we, there, right now, we just cannot get enough truck drivers. Uh, truck driving uh, it, you know, there, there's always this threat on the horizon that it's going to be fully automated vehicles and the truck drivers are going to be gone. But right now, um, we need truck drivers. In fact, it's the uh, number one job posting uh, in the last two months uh, in the Houston market. That there is a great demand. And I'm, I'm thinking as well that with the, the high unemployment rate, and of course, we'll talk just a little bit more uh, about that and the fact that there are a lot of individuals who are looking for work and the need to retool. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that the industry is also finding that with the re retirements that they are experiencing, as well as with persons who are now in jobs, but not the middle skill jobs that they need, that they're having those challenges as well. So are you hearing that also and the pressures that they are feeling to maintain their work that they have to do in order to be competitive? So let's start with the demographic piece. And you, know, you hit something that's still gonna be a reality. You know, and one of the things we don't know coming out of this recovery is how people you know, approach how secure they feel for retirement, much less what consumer behaviors have changed. But there is still you know, kind of a looming demographic of you know, retirees that are gonna hit at some point. It's just a question of when. In an employer's workforce, you know, workers who are already there are very likely to be folks that could be upskilled. And a lot of employers may or may not have the training program, which then, you know, presents an opportunity for Houston Community College or any of the community colleges to help employers and partner with employers to help them upskill and train their incumbent workers because those folks already understand the culture. And that would create movement at the lower levels for folks to enter with that company. So I think we're going to see an upgrading of existing workers in many respects. I agree with you. And we're going to continue this conversation. We are going to take a, a break now. I appreciate what you are saying. And on the other side of the break, we're going to talk about some of the the opportunities and the strategies to train a qualified workforce. And we touched on some of those in the first segment, but we want to continue that conversation. We'll be right back. Travion. His mom went to Houston Community College, so choosing that was easy. Choosing what to study from more than 100 instructional fields? Not so much. HCC. For everyone, anytime. Welcome back to Credential Up Houston. Our focus is on a special series, Jobs Now Houston. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for the work that you're doing to keep us informed. And in this segment, I would like for us to discuss opportunities and strategies to retool the workforce. 
However, before we begin that conversation, I would like for us now to think about some of those challenges and issues that were mentioned in the first segment and how we might look at innovative strategies to try to address those in ways that will help us to quickly reform the workforce. So what are your thoughts about that, Mr. Beard? So I think there are a couple things. You know, as we ended the last segment, there's a great opportunity that I think many employers are going to be looking for, which is how do they strengthen the skills of their existing workforce, the incumbent workers. And so that creates an opportunity, uh, you know, for an institution like Houston Community College to be able to do that. I think the other piece is how do we take kind of a, you know, learner centric approach to this, which is there are obviously folks that are unemployed today that have existing skill sets, they have existing education and experience, but it also shows the fragility of the occupation that they hold. And can we find kind of an adjacent occupation that builds off their existing skill set that then we can provide you know, an incremental set, incremental set of skills that allows them to move into a different job. And they're only going to make that decision if the job, you know, still has, you know, good demand for, for those kinds of workers, as well as pays at least as much as they're making. You know, and just think about it from a user's perspective. And I go back to a good way to even future-proof everybody is to improve their digital skills. And I think we've got to up that game because that digital transition is not going to stop. Um, and so I also think, you know, this whole notion of how do we embed in folks that they're going to have to be continual learners because this issue of continuing to upskill and reskill and new, learn new skills is going to be a reality going forward. That's, that's a very good point. And I think about a number of individuals, particularly given that I think the, is the average or maybe it's the median age of Houstonians is about 35 and there are many individuals who are a little bit reluctant to use technology. So what would be the strategy to engage more persons who either are intimidated by or just have not been introduced to the technology to begin to take that, that what will then be a, a gigantic leap? So Dr. Webster, do you have any thoughts about that piece of it that could help us to address some of those, those challenges? as an innovation. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that we're seeing is, at least at the younger age, obviously our, our, our digital natives, and they have this sense of using technology in a different way than some of the, the older folks do. That said, that's, that's actually causing college to change a lot of what it does in terms of uh, digital application in the classroom. So, you know, if you take our interior design program, uh, the students' portfolios are no longer in a large portfolio. They're actually a digital portfolio that they present to panels of architects and, and designers. In this regard, I think that that's the type of thing that needs to happen so that when students do leave our door, the next door that they're, they go to, they're going to have that skill set in the back of the pocket. Uh, you know, it, it reminds me of a, an example. Peter kind of jogged my memory on, on an example about a year ago I saw at Centerpoint Energy uh, they've actually taken the jackhammers that they use when they're trying to dig down for uh, underground electrical pipe, and they've, they've stopped using them they, because people would, you know, the, the workers would get out there, they hit the pipe with the jackhammer, and then obviously they'd get electric shock. They've actually got a system that works remotely. This, the, the worker isn't even on site. They're, they're looking at it from off site. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a robot, basically, with a jackhammer at the end of it. I mean, those are the type of skills, even in the construction industry, that, that folks are going to need to come with. And, and so, you know, it's, the, the more that we can train at the outset on those skills, I think the better off we'll be in the long run. And I think to Michael's point, this whole notion of are robots going to take over? I don't think they are. I think they're, we're going to have to learn to work at, beside them, but they're always going to need someone who's the technician that's going to be either driving them or guiding them or fixing them. You know, I think that makes the learning process a whole lot more interesting, in fact. And I think that might touch on some of the points that you made, Peter, about the interesting aspect of the innovation is that you're able now to get individuals who may not be digital natives to now be intrigued by what the technology can provide them and will then take that plunge and start learning more about it and become really quite excited about it, in fact. Yeah, and I, and I think that's the case. And when you think about what has happened you know, over the last several months 
we're ordering things online. So a lot of folks are already having to confront their digital you know, reluctance by the fact that they're doing this. And I would add a point to Michael's uh, point. You know, when you think about how quickly businesses shift to do, be able to do online things, application development and coding is going to be a big issue because people are going to change and want to quickly change. So in addition to the cyber, I would add application development. So that takes us then to the point of continuing education uh, for the aging population. And that becomes critically important. I know that Upskill Houston and the Greater Houston Partnership is doing a great job in outreaching to the business community. And the Houston Community College is also working various learning modalities that can attract students and will fit into their schedule, irrespective of whether or not they want to be online or they want to be on campus or whether or not there are other opportunities where they will have that synchronous learning as well. So I'd like to, to hear now as we look at the innovations about how the Houston Community College is now using the new initiative that has been established, the Jobs Now Houston, and then with Upskill Houston, how that message can be conveyed to the business community. So uh, Dr. Webster, tell us just a little bit about that initiative and how in continuing education that can fold into the work of the Upskill Houston as well, as that message is is really imparted on a much broader scale to the community. Yeah, well, we started Jobs Now Houston uh, initiative in, in a response to the uh, pandemic and the, the jobs that were being shucked off, uh, where at the same time there was a lot of job postings out there that folks that could get into these jobs. So uh, looking at all of the job postings, uh, we've paired those with uh, specific training that we offer. and. Uh, go to the website, you, you can access first what the job entails, how much the salary is, what uh, availability there is in our region, and then uh, connect up to training that we offer uh, here in, in HCC. For the most part, uh, we, we want to look at the jobs that, uh, you know, as Peter was saying, we can upskill folks in the, the short term and get them into a, an occupation pretty quickly. Uh, those are, for, for the most part, our continuing education programming. Uh, and we, it's listed under fast track or fast training uh, on the website. Uh, but we also have a section that is for just a, a, a larger body of occupations that will take longer than a short term continuing ed program, but are still in high demand and students could get into and get a good job as well. So two, two avenues to good training that, that provides for even better jobs. And I think that's the key to the jobs now. Uh, we're tracking uh, on a, on a, regular basis, the, the job postings in our region, make sure that, that we're connecting those to the training bill. Very good. And we'll come back to that as well. And then we'd like to go to some of the points that, that Mr. Beard made as well with regards to some of the high needs industries at this point. But we're going to take another break right now and continue our conversation about access to training and then getting that information to the residents. So please stay with us. We'll be right back. Meet Bethel. She has a passion for fashion and a need to succeed. So she's going for two associate's degrees at Houston Community College, fashion design and merchandising. HCC, for everyone, anytime. These are challenging times. We are all doing our share to battle the coronavirus. We view an attack against one faith or ethnic group as an attack against all of us. We are all in this together. Many of us are immigrants. The virus affects all nationalities. We all work together. We, we are, are all, all Texans. Texans. Meet Lisa. When she's not moving to a Zydeco beat, she's making moves towards a better job with a nursing degree from Houston Community College. Ça c'est bon, Lisa. HCC, for everyone, anytime. Well, thank you for staying with us, Prudential Up Houston, with a special focus on jobs in Houston. Our guests are Mr. Peter Beard of the Greater Houston Partnership and Dr. Michael Webster of the Houston Community College. Now let us discuss in-demand jobs in Houston and access to training. That's really very important. And in the first segment, Mr. Beard made reference to some of those in-demand 
occupations. And we're also wanting to talk about the training opportunities and the access to training. So let's just pair those up now and look at how we not only provide the information about what is available, but also talk about the training opportunities. So what is being done, Mr. Beard, with respect to conveying messages to the business and industry community about the next steps? We can hear about the challenges, we can hear about the issues, and we can talk about the barriers, but what about ways to creatively address the problem that we now have with respect to businesses getting the talent pool that they need? So what messages are conveyed with respect to the training that is available as well from the business side and Upskill Houston? What are your thoughts? My thoughts are I'm going to do a little self-promotion, which is Upskill Houston was actually designed to engage employers in a different way to participate and partner with education and community-based organizations to deliver that talent pipeline. And so we have always tried to create a table that consists of employers. It's led by employers for employers to be able to do that. And in fact, you know, next week we'll be gathering our executive committee, which are kind of the, some of the top leaders of the initiative that include plant managers from petrochemical, construction, healthcare, transportation, to, to find out and listen to what's going on, as well as to understand what are the pathways that they're seeing for, you know, bringing folks back to work, you know, whether it's their furloughed workforce or the workforce that they need. And I think the other piece at the Greater Houston Partnership where we do other pieces of work is to look at how do we attract new and different businesses to the region. And so, <clears throat> you know, Houston, you know, positions, positions itself as the energy capital of the world. Unfortunately, a part of that energy industry right now is confronted with low oil prices. But we've also begun attracting what we would say are the clean tech jobs, the, the, you know, the, the types of industries and businesses that are thinking about what is it going to be in a world where we don't have petroleum as kind of the basis for our energy economy. So those would be the other places, you know, the wind turbines, you know, obviously how do we do carbon recapture and all those technologies are going to provide opportunity for folks. And so I think those are some of the other pieces we've got to be looking at. And then as Mike uh, mentioned earlier, logistics. We have, you know, we have the ports within the broad region. Uh, so there's a lot of movement and we need, you know, the, the logistics and supply chain pieces of it. So there are lots of opportunities, but it really starts with keeping the employers engaged at the table and recognizing that they have a huge part to play in, you know, partnering with education to tell, you know, folks, here are the skills we need in the workforce and here's how those skills are changing. That's, that's, that's very good. And I would presume also that to perhaps look at uh, not just only the internships, but the mentorships and to conceivably um, look at selecting a pool of potential candidates so that they will know that once they complete the training, if they meet all other eligibility requirements, that they then have a job. And I think that would give an additional incentive to the students who are enrolling mm -hmm. in the short-term training programs or even the degree programs for that matter to persist. That's a possibility to at least think about and it's conceivably being done now, but at least it's something to contemplate just in case it's not. No, and I think we do, we do try to encourage that. We think work-based learning in multiple forms and we have to find a continuum because as you know, bringing an intern on you know, is a commitment on both people's parts. And so we've begun to explore what's that broad you know, continuum from a mentorship to what we now know are what some folks called micro internships, which are project-based efforts that could be done in five or five to 40 hours, but you're still getting work experience from a student, but it's not the full kind of let's bring them on site and I, you know, we're going to have an intern, you know, and I think we've got to find the range of opportunities so that employers can engage, you know, at an appropriate level and continue to upgrade. For sure. So Dr. Webster, <clears throat> pardon me, what is the mindset that those seeking work, and seeking training should have at this point because sometimes it's very difficult to uh, encourage some students to persist if they think that it's going to be a long journey and they still may not get a job 
So what should be that mindset for those students who enroll in the programs, whether it's short-term certificate-based programs, the micro-credentials, or the associate's degree programs? What are your thoughts about that? A couple of things. So, you know, if we go from basically six weeks to two years, uh, whatever program within that span somebody is engaged in, they're engaging in not a job training program, they're engaging in a career planning program. And I think if you look at two years of your life turning into a 30 year career, that's a pretty strong investment that's very affordable and, and worth taking. Uh, to that extent, um, one also has to think that you start at one point an entry level training program, there's gonna be opportunities to take additional training along the way. So you might start out as a certified nursing assistant or certified nursing aide, and then decide you wanna do an LVN program, and then decide you wanna do an RN program that whole pathway, that career pathway that you're building uh, is, is, is gonna be one, lucrative in the long run, and two, an investment in yourself. So I think uh, folks just would need to look at the long-term planning that they're doing in terms of their own career. Uh, there's so much opportunity in Houston, even with the pandemic and even with the recent uh, issues with oil and gas, that uh, there, there, there's just a wealth of jobs out there. Uh, you know, in fact, if you, if you look just at the construction sector, they didn't stop during the, the pandemic. In fact, they, they increased uh, production because they had people off the roads. They could get out there and do the civil construction that they needed to do. They didn't have people in buildings, so if they had some retrofitting to do or remodeling to do, those were happening uh, at, a, at a really faster pace than, than they normally would because there were some people around. So I can't say enough that, that the opportunity is great in Houston. Folks just need to start their, their career. And the last thing I would say, you know, you, you started this segment talking about access. And I, and I want to tell uh, folks that, that there's a money and, and tuition and fee shouldn't be a barrier. There's, there's several avenues for us to access dollars for students to come in and, and, and get training. Uh, from our foundation to the workforce uh, solutions offices, we've got uh, financial aid available for students. Sounds very good. We have another minute left and I'd like to get like a 30 second wrap up from each of you gentlemen about what you think should be something else to plant as a seed in the minds of the viewers. I mean, I'll take the first shot, which is kind of building off of the conversation we've just been having. Obviously, we've figured out how to do this thing virtually. And to Michael's point around how are we exposing people to the kinds of careers that are available? I mean, the reality is Houston is too big and we can't deliver a worker to a specific location to talk to a class. But you know, now that we have figured this out, I think what we, you'll find from our side is how do we get employers with one of their workers talking about their industry and the job and what's the progression. And I think that's going to be one of the big things that comes out of this is how do we do deeper career exploration and exposure so people can at least think about what they want to do. Excellent. And we have about 10 seconds left. Uh, Dr. Webster? Uh, I would just say first step, check out jobsnowhouston.org. Okay, very, very good. Thank you so much. Many thanks to our guests, Mr. Peter Beard and Dr. Michael Webster. And thank you, our viewers, for watching. Our future programs in this, in this series will focus on the specific industry seeking talent, the job requirements, and how you can get short-term training at HCC, and the follow-up support to connect you to job opportunities. Meanwhile, I ask you to go to the future programming website. Also, would like for you to take a look at Upskill Houston as well as the website that Houston Community College has on jobsnowhouston.org. Again, to our viewers, thank you so much for watching and to our guests, deep, deep appreciation for your support. And please, to everyone viewing, do not forget to credential up. So we will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you.